welcome. My name is Kristen, and I am so glad that you decided to join us this morning on Salem's online campus. We have a really great message planned for you today, so let's join in. We, so in this series that we're doing called Divine, we understand that in the Christmas season, we, we highlight the divine moment where, where God came down. Where, where, where he vacated where he was in eternity in heaven and came down and, and, but didn't show up in our lives uh, just as a king that showed up with, with horses and chariots and armies and, and, and coming to take over in what we would think the Messiah, the anointed one, would come to do. But rather, he came up in a way, in a posture that would parallel how we would be able to interact with him. He came as a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger, in a place that was messy, in a place that was harsh, hard, and cruel, often like life that we encounter. Please don't think that the manger scene that you've encountered leading up to this moment was the hallmark, picturesque moment where, where, where like everything looks pristine and pretty. Mangers, historically, in those days were more like caves. They were harsh, hard, cruel. It's, it's so interesting that when he shows up, he shows up in a posture that he can relate one to another with us. That he didn't come full grown and just showed up as king, he came as a baby so that he could learn to function and operate the same way you learn to function and operate in life. That he came in a manner so that he could, he could learn what it would be like to be under the pressures of life and under the worries and the cares of what the world offers. That he came so that he could relate one to another with frustrations, with anxieties, with fear. He came to a messy situation because he knew that 2,000 years later he would encounter us where we are in a messy situation and we could relate one to another. And so in the Advent season, while we talk about hope, love, peace, Right, the things that we anticipate with his arrival in Advent, the awaiting, we first have to know who it is that offers hope, love, joy, and peace. And then why? Emmanuel, yes, God with us, but Isaiah would pen it out before that, before he would even show up. In Isaiah chapter 9, The description of this king, this divine king within a cave. For a child is born to us, a son is given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Peace is an interesting concept. It's it's seen 523 times inside the confines of your Bible. Peace, Webster would define peace. Uh, Do do we have the definition? Uh, Peace is a state of quiet. Another understanding is that peace is the cessation of war with with public enemies. That peace would be reconciliation. That peace, uh, hear me, uh, would be uh, tranquility and freedom from disturbance or agitation. That Webster would define peace as to become quiet or silent. But you can't give what you don't first possess. And so he doesn't just offer us some off-the-shelf, prepackaged peace, but he is the prince of peace. He's the warden of peace. He is the leader of peace. He is the captain of peace. And so he has within himself what he offers to us is peace that surpasses all of our understanding. It's not just a feel-good moment, but, but he offers in the midst of hardship. He offers in the midst of heartache. He offers in the midst of despair and disturbance. He offers in the midst of distraction in the world. He offers us peace. He's off, he offers us something that we can't get on our own. He offers it, he offers it to us first in the message uh, of Christ, the message in the gospel in Christ, the message of peace of God to men, we see it. It's announced by angels in Luke 2, 14. Glory to God in the highest and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. He offers this. This is the reason he came. The message of God to a broken, hurting humanity. It is peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ, Romans 5, 1. 
The message of God for peace to a broken, hurting humanity, it's peace between Jew and Gentile in Ephesians 2, 14 and 15. This message of God to a broken and hurting world, it is, it is an essential element, this, uh, the peace, it's an essential element in the spiritual kingdom of God, Romans 4, 17. It's in the message of Jesus, this peace that he offers when he says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's the message of God offering peace, reconciling we who are far and removed to him who is holy, him who is set apart, him who there is none like, that we could not get to him, so he offering peace came to us. This, this is peace. This is, what's, this is what's offered. Peace in the Hebrew term means shalom. It means, I preached on this I think a month or so ago, it means primarily soundness and health. But it's also coming to signify prosperity and well-being. An easy way to surmise it would be shalom, meaning nothing missing and nothing broken. Come on, not just... Not just, not just in, in various aspects, but in all aspects of your life, spirit, soul, and body, in, in your mind, you can have shalom where there is nothing missing and nothing broken. In your body, regardless of how old or how young you are, you can have shalom, nothing missing and nothing broken. In, in, in your heart and your mind, in emotions that would run wayward and get you off track being emotionally driven and not spirit-led, you, sir, you, ma'am, can have shalom. Alone, nothing missing and nothing broken. This is what he offers. He doesn't offer you emotional highs. He offers you stability and consistency where he steps into your moment and gives you what you don't have. Nothing missing and nothing broken. This is the peace that he offers. It's also, hear me, it's a common understanding of a greeting but also a farewell. Shalom. It's a declaration to those you encounter, and it's a blessing to those you depart from. Isn't that how God meets us? That when he encounters us, he brings and offers peace, but then he blesses us and then makes us peace to then send us out to wherever we're going. This, we, we encapsulate, we become walking shalom where we go out and we meet people in the highways and byways, where we go out and we meet people inside of our sphere of influence. We may not be called to the world, but sir, ma'am, you are called to your world and you are called to bring shalom into that darkness, called to bring shalom into that chaos, called to bring shalom into their despair. And so then you bring in this greeting of shalom. And then you're blessing it. You leave shalom with them. Hear me. Regardless of how dysfunctional your life may be. Regardless of how distraught your life may be. Regardless of how distracted things in your life have become. Hear me and hear me clearly. God wants to offer you peace. He wants to offer you peace. He is, not, he is not concerned with how broken your past may be. He speaks peace to it and brings wholeness to your past. Regardless of the fear and the worry of the future, he is not minimizing it, and, but he is not turned off by it. He speaks into your future and says shalom into your future and offers nothing missing and nothing broken. And so we encounter this shalom, this God of the universe, this holy and set apart God that wants to make you whole and wants to see you move forward with an understanding that he is for you and not against you. He's not mad at you, but he is mad about you, that he loved you so much that he vacated heaven and came to find you. You didn't find God. You didn't know where to look. But he showed up with healing in his hands and for the brokenness on the inside of you, for the hurt on the inside of you, for what is disconnected on the inside of you. He offers you shalom so that in your life, in your relationships, in the people you encounter, you bring nothing missing and nothing broken. This is what God offers us today. I want us to look at, we're gonna go to Mark's gospel. I'm gonna kind of like peek into a, Little bit of this is the kingdom. If you don't know what that is, is we've been in a series the entire year called This is the Kingdom where we're walking through verse by verse, word by word, 
with, with the entire gospel of Mark. So we're gonna kind of jump into that a little bit and I'm just gonna steal content from it. If, if, you, if you have your Bible, turn with me to Mark 4, verse 35 through 41. If you didn't, you can borrow our big Bibles in the sky. You just have to return them when you're done. Everyone gets free coffee for being able to bring their Bible, whether physically or on the wall. It's fine, right? No one, I'm telling six foot jokes to folks that are 5'10", right now. <laughs> free coffee, it's all, it's all free. Don't worry about it, all right, whatever. All right, I'm just giving you time to turn in your Bibles. <laughs> Mark 4, 35 through 41. On the same day, when evening had come, he said to them, let us cross over to the other side. Verse 36 says, now when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as he was. And other little boats were also with him. Verse 37 says, and a great windstorm arose and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. But he was in the stern asleep on a pillow and they awoke and said to him, teacher, do you not care that we're perishing? Can I just in, insert, let me, let me come down here. I'll talk to you guys. I think you guys are ready for this real quick. I just, I'm just gonna park here for a minute. From the NIV, you can get it at any local Christian bookstore, Nathan's Interpreted Version. <laughs> My first name's Nathan. Just, like, oh! <laughs> you ever feel like you're in the middle of a storm and you're asking the question, God, where are you? God, do you care that I feel like I'm drowning? Are you aware that I feel like my life is being rocked right now? Do, has it, I, I, would never, I would never surmise to be disrespectful to Jesus, but in this moment, I, I can understand what the disciples are. Do you, not, has it crossed your conscious uh, that we are in a moment where we feel like we are perishing and you're over here just taking a nap? One, I'm thankful that naps are godly. But two, this doesn't really feel like the moment to nap. This doesn't feel like the Sunday, the post-Sunday afternoon nap moment. We are, the wind is hitting us sideways. The boat is being rocked back and forth. Let me go over here. I think you guys are ready. The boat is being rocked back and forth. I'm seasick because it's a little boat and I don't do well on the water anyway. And so I'm in this moment where I'm feeling like I am losing everything I have, where I, it, the water is hitting me. If this is a moment that I'm in God and you're asleep you ever feel like you're in a storm and God is sleeping you're you can't sleep at night fearing worrying being anxious and you feel like God is asleep you're you're mustering all that you can to to put a smile on your face and walk into work and you're like, God, are you even, are you even with me in this, in this moment? I don't, I, this makes no sense to me. This, 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 this can't be how this is supposed to work out. This can't be how it's supposed to go. Are you even aware? I feel like I'm drowning. I can't be the only one that's ever felt that way. I can't be the only one that, that's ever felt like God. I just... I am, I'm not understanding your, sir, I am not understanding your posture in this moment. It makes no sense to the situation I'm in. You're with me, but you feel disengaged. You're with me, but you feel absent even though I know you're present. You are, you're with me, but I feel like you don't even care. Can anyone else relate to how the disciples are maybe responding in the moment? Here, let's, let's read along. Verse 39 says, Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. But he said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? 41, and we're landing the plane on the, this passage of scripture. 
It says, and they feared exceedingly and said to one another, who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? I, I wanna pull out some things from this passage of scripture that really just kinda like leap off the page to me. The first thing is, verse 35, I think it's 35. Do I have it, verse 35? Uh, yeah, 35. Oh, thank you. On the same day when the evening come, he said to them, let us cross over to the other side. When you said yes to Jesus, you, you said yes to a moment where you begin to follow him. I'm, I'm not, some of us have said yes to Jesus and we signed up for fire insurance because we didn't wanna go to hell. Like, yeah, that makes sense, that's logical. I don't, I don't wanna go there, so let me, I will go there. So I'll say, I'll say yes. I will make the emotional decision to say yes to Jesus. But for those of us that signed up for a little bit more than fire insurance, hear me. He's giving instruction with intention. Here is where he has picked them up on this side of the moment. And he speaks to them and says, let us cross over to the other side. And so I don't know where you are in your faith journey and in your travel. I don't know what storms you've encountered. I don't know uh, what fears you've had to face. I don't know what trials you've had to walk through. But what I gather and surmise from this simple part right here is that when he said yes to allowing them to follow him, he had every intention of picking them up from where they were and getting them to where he intended them to be. You have a calling on your life, sir. You have a a calling and a purpose on your life, ma'am. And when you follow Jesus, he has no intention or thought in his mind that he is gonna leave you halfway where he found you. He has every intention of walking along with you. Come on, somebody. He walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own. Come on, there's a moment, yes, where fear may come in, but I am walking hand in hand with the lover of my soul. He calls me the apple of his eye. He he said, I will, he will walk through the fire with me. He, when the flames come in and the waves come in, they will not overtake me. He is walking with me. He has no intention of leaving me. Come on, I don't know what the storm in your life looks like, but I just want to let you know he's with you and he didn't bring you this far to leave you. He, the diagnosis that you're facing, he didn't leave you. He didn't bring you this far to leave you. Come on, the situation that you're facing, he didn't bring you this far to leave you. He said, let us go to the other side and he has all power and authority in his hands to get you from where you are to where he has purposed and intended you to be Somebody say amen. amen. I'm fired up, y'all. I might be a little over caffeinated. I don't know yet. I just plan on emptying both barrels because I get excited because I know the storms that I've had to face. I know the doctor's reports that I've had to face. I know the situations I've had to encounter. But here's what I also know. If I can just hold on, even if it's by a thread, to the hem of his garment, he will bring me to where he has promised. Our job is not to find comfort in this life. Our job, and if that is what you thought this was all about, you've been sold an errant gospel. Our job is to make disciples of everyone that we come in contact with. Our job is to make an impact on everyone we come in contact with. I love the way Reinhard Bonnke says it. The late, great Reinhard Bonnke. He said that our job is to plunder hell and populate heaven. That that's what we're called to do. I love how the Crab family says it. That he never promised that the cross would not get heavy and the hills would not be hard to climb. He never offered a victory without fighting, but he said help would always come in time. So remember when you're standing in the valley of decision and the adversary says, give in. Just hold on because our Lord will show up and he will take you through the fire again. I'm not saying it's not going to be hot. I'm telling you he's going to take you through. I'm not saying it's not going to be wet. I'm saying he's going to take you through. I'm not saying it's not going to be noisy. I'm just here to let you know on Sunday morning, he intends to take you through. Slap somebody around you and tell him, tell him he's taking you through. Second thing in verses here, let me. 
Yeah, yep, yep. 39 says, then he arose. Thank you. He arose, rebuked the wind, and said to the sea, peace, comma, be still. Peace means to be silent. Peace means to reconcile. Peace means the cessation from war. Peace means to be still. So there's redundancy when Jesus is looking after he's been made awake and says, peace, comma, peace. And redundancy doesn't make sense unless he intends on speaking to two separate audiences. Commas, here, commas, indicate to the reader a separation of words, watch, to prevent misreading. So when Jesus is speaking peace, he's speaking to two separate audiences. The first audience that we see is the disciples. He looks at them because they're weary, worn, and fear, fear driven, and he says to them, peace in the sense of silence to hold one's peace. Because in the face of the storm that you're facing, in the face of the trials that you're in, hear me, uh, uh, that if, if I can't speak faith into the moment, I just need to be at peace and be silent. Come on, in, in, if, if, if I can't, you know, you've heard the phrase, if you can't say nothing nice, don't say nothing at all, all right? Well, it's the same thing for faith. You're better off not even, not even speaking doubt and not even speaking worry and encouraging the fear on the inside of you. Just remain, watch, at peace and be still. If you, if you don't have a scripture to stand on, don't even start speaking to it. Don't, don't just, just, just be, be, be silent because we're told to walk by faith and not by sight. We're told to walk by faith, leaning and trusting and relying on God, not relying on what we see around me because what I see around me will let me know that I'm about to drown. But the fact of the matter is that God is in the boat with me and he said, we're going to the other side. So if I don't have the faith to stand, I ought to just be, watch, at peace and just be silent. Uh, uh, it, what I need to do is Psalms 46.10. It's a scripture I've been leaning on for quite some time now. Be still and know that he, that he is God. In the moment of my storm, I just need to be still. Watch. Be at peace peace, be at rest. I'm not, I'm not doubting the validity of the situation you're in. I am not negating or minimizing that you are feeling the wind around you and you are feeling the storm brewing around you. I'm just saying I need to be still and realize that the author and the finisher of my faith is in the middle of this moment with me, that he has not left me abandoned to myself, but he is with me. So I need to be at Peace, knowing that he is God. I need to be still, knowing that he is God. I need to just simply wait upon the Lord and cast my cares upon him. The Bible says he will keep in perfect peace him whose mind is stayed on him. If I don't have the faith to speak to my storm, the best thing I can do, we see this right here out of verse 39, is be still, be at peace. The second group, and this is where I really wanted to preach. I haven't preached up until this moment. So if you're like, man, he's really loud. Just, we got earplugs in the lobby for you. Second audience that he speaks to is the storm. I'm butchering this, but just pretend like I'm pronouncing it right anyway. C-O-P-E-O. It means to be silent, to cease speaking. Fimu, to muzzle or to gag. The other audience that God starts speaking to in this moment is the storm. And I wanna let you know, I know a lot of your stories of 2023. I know of a lot of your stories where you've been rocked and reeled by the storms of life. I know a lot of your stories where, where you, it's, it was everything, ma'am and sir, you could do to get here to this moment that even while you're sitting here, you are holding on the edge of your seat because the anxiety that is at war on the inside of you, the storm that is brewing on the inside, you've got your game face on and you look like you've got it all together, but on the inside, you are rocking and reeling from the wind and the waves hitting you. And I wanna let you know, 
even at the end of 2023, that God is about to speak to your storms. Come on, somebody. That, that heaven still has something to say about the fight that you're in. Heaven still has the final say for the situation you're in. Let's look at the Bible. When death had gripped the body of Jairus' daughter, Jesus shows up because heaven has the final say and says she's not dead, she's asleep. Come on, when, when death had, had gripped the body of Lazarus and Jesus showed up because heaven has the final say, Jesus shows up and says, Lazarus, come forth. Come on, when, when death had gripped the body of Jesus for three days in a tomb, uh, come on, the, 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 the disciples showed up and angels made them aware. Why do you seek the living among the dead? Why does that matter? Because heaven always has the final say. And in your life, I don't care how big the storm is. I don't care how bad the storm is. I don't know what the storm is. Worry, fear, anxiety, the future, the past. Heaven has the final say. And God is about to start speaking in the middle of your storm, bringing order into the chaos because the storm responded to the same voice of structure, the same voice of order that it had heard at the inception of creation when God stood on nothing, looked into nothing and commanded something to come out of it and it responded. This is the same moment where creation, rocking and reeling, heard the order in the voice of God. Man, I'm fired up this morning. God spoke and creation recognized the authority. God, and it, it, it's, it, the storm arrested itself. The storm muzzled itself. The disciples did nothing because heaven started talking. And I'm not here to... I'm not here to pump you up for the end of the year, but I want to let you know I genuinely believe at the end of this year where you've been fighting storms the entire year, heaven is about to start speaking into your storm. Come on, that in the middle of chaos, there's about to become structure. In the middle of disorder, there's about to be order because heaven is going to start speaking into that moment. All I have to do is hold on and not give up hope. Lydia, why don't you, whoever's coming up here, I don't know who you are. I don't, whatever you guys are doing, I just work here. Some of you think I only work like 30, 30 minutes a week. You don't even realize we got a nine o'clock service. So by your standards, I work an hour a week. <laughs> I'm just messing with you. I'm just messing with you. The last thing out of verse... 37 and 38. Can we, can we put it up there, Emily? And a great windstorm arose and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. Verse 38 says, but he, he was in the stern. I know you feel like he's asleep, but I just wanna let you know that while the boat is filling, and full of water, it's also full of Jesus. Come on, the, the boat is full of water and Jesus. In your storm, I understand that the boat is filling with water, but it's also full of Jesus. Come on, the, in the middle of your trial, where you're being overwhelmed, and you don't know how you're gonna make it through, that the storm is full of water, your boat is full of water, but it's also full of Jesus. I just gotta let you know, even if the boat goes down, he's still a wet water walker. Come on, think about that. When, he, when Jesus walked upon the water, he, had already, he was going to defy the laws of physics. He was gonna defy what was naturally should happen. But I believe it's the Gospel of John that says he intended to pass them by. When he's walking on the water, he didn't intend to get in the boat with them. He, watch, he was looking for someone to be so filled with faith that they would step out of the edge of the boat and graduate their walk and walk alongside him. So even if the boat sinks, he walks 
with me and talks with me. Let the boat sink. Let it sink. Maybe, maybe the boat is so burdened down with the baggage of life that you've been carrying. The fears, the worries, the hopelessness and despair. Maybe in his sovereignty, he wants the boat to sink so that the baggage sinks with it. But he has no intention of letting you drown. Even when, even when Peter took his eyes off Jesus and began to sink, the Bible says that Jesus reached out his hand, meaning contextually that Jesus was close enough to grab him and picked him up. I don't think that Peter was ever supposed to be in boats again. I think his walk was supposed to graduate so that he walked upon the impossible the rest of his life. Maybe in God's sovereignty, he's allowed the storm in your life because he's trying to get you to a moment where you have filled the vessel with all of your fears, all of your worries, all of your anxieties, all of your mess, all of your problems so that the storm can sink not only the boat but the baggage. And that you, ma'am, you, sir, continue the journey with him to the other side. Because that was always the purpose. Whether they walked or whether they were in the boat, the intended destination was the other side. Think of that. Come on. It's, it's in the middle of my storm, the Prince of Peace is accessible to me. If I will remember Psalms 46, 1, that God is a refuge, a very present help in time of need. That's who he is. That's why it doesn't matter if the boat sinks. He, Jesus wasn't there for the boat. Jesus was there for those inside the boat. Does that make sense? Maybe it's a shift in perspective. I'm worried that I'm sinking. Jesus has no intention of letting you sink. If the boat sinks, who cares? As long as I have Jesus, I have everything. Let's join in. I'm so glad you decided to join us today. If you would like to worship with your giving and help Salem make an impact on our community, you can text the amount that you would like to give to the phone number 84321, or you can go to our website, salemcommunity.church. Here at Salem, we are intent on creating community that is centered on Christ. Hope I see you next week.